All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we appreciate you joining us today and happy National Ag Day. Um, we're really happy that you've decided to celebrate uh, the occasion with us. My name is Rob LaRue and I'm president of National Farmers Union, an organization uh, that is dedicated to working on behalf of and advocating for family farmers and ranchers across the US. But we also know that our members depend on many people to get their food from our farms to the consumer. This is something that we as farmers have known for a long time, but the pandemic has made it abundantly clear just how critical every single food chain worker is. And after this past year's experience uh, with the pandemic, we've also discovered a number of challenges within the food system that we have. And so we hope to, in today's discussion, chat a little bit about those challenges specifically, kind of the root cause of them, and also with a look forward at what the possible solutions might be. Because what is also clear is that in this industry, with these big changes that we're facing, we're going to need collaborative thinking and action to address it. And so we've brought together representatives from across the food system to discuss these issues and possible solutions. Joining us today, we have Patty Edelberg, who is Vice President at National Farmers Union, Bruce Goldstein, President, Farm Worker Justice, Mark Lauritsen, International Vice President for Meat Packing and Food Processing, United Food and Commercial Workers, Dan Simons, Co-Owner, Farmers Restaurant Group, and Jillian Meyer, No Kid Hungry Director, Share Our Strength. We know that there are a number of other sector, you know, individuals and sections within the food system, but we are pleased to have this you know, important kind of critical cross section of experts to join us today and talk about the challenge. At this point, I'd like to invite each of the panelists to in turn, uh, give a short introduction of who they are and the organization that they are representing. Patty, let's start with you. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm Patty Edelberg. I am the Vice President of the National Farmers Union. Uh, I, along with Rob, uh, represent about 250,000 uh, farm families across the nation. Uh, we, we fight for family farmers, we fight for uh, small communities, uh, anything that, uh, any of their needs that we can help with is where we're, where we're trying to do. Um, it's a very grassroots organization. Uh, the members are the ones that set our policy, the members are the ones that uh, tell us what we need to be acting on uh, at any time. So uh, beyond the National Farmers Union, I'm actually a dairy farmer as well. So I'm a dairy farmer in central Wisconsin. My husband and I milk about 120,000, or 120,000, 120 cows, uh, family farm here, um, about 300 acres of land. So uh, we do our best every day, out on the farm every day, uh, and. Nationally, we're fighting for farmers every day. That's me. All right. Thank you, Patty. Uh, Bruce, let's turn to you. Uh, thank you. I'm Bruce Goldstein. I'm president of Farm Worker Justice in Washington, DC. Uh, Farm Worker Justice is a national advocacy, litigation, and education organization. Its mission is to empower farm workers to improve their wages and working conditions, occupational safety and health, immigration status and access to justice. Uh, we engage in a variety of uh, activities, ad advocacy and litigation, education and training, capacity building, corporate social responsibility initiatives. Our organization focuses on labor intensive agriculture. Uh, so a lot of fruits and vegetables, dairy farms as, as well. There are about 2.4 million farm workers in the United States and a uh, majority of them are undocumented. So uh, a lot of our work has always been focused around uh, immigration policy and its interaction with everything else in their lives. Again, thanks very much for having me. Absolutely. Mark. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Mark Lauritsen. I'm the International Vice President with the United Food and Commercial Workers. Um, we represent 1.3 million members in the uh, food supply chain in the United States. I have the honor of representing the division that represents about 260,000 meatpacking and food processing workers. Uh, our union also has 700,000 retail workers in the, in the supply chain as well, working at, at, at your local grocery stores. Um, as we go through, I, I, I hope, and I know everybody on this uh, Zoom is probably already fully aware, but COVID has proved how linked we all really are and how important we are to each other. Um, but hopefully, 
out of this, um, the general public starts to get more woke to the fact that this is a supply chain and, and food is all linked together. And it's an absolute honor to be here with you, Rob. All right, thank you, Mark. Dan. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Simons. I'm on the team at uh, Farmers Restaurant Group, and we are, a, a, we are a restaurant group that exists specifically to advocate on behalf of American family farmers and to try to be in our own small but maybe influential way, be a market maker um, by helping the, the dining public learn to ask questions about where their food comes from and how their food is prepared and the implications of the choices that diners make at the table. So we have seven restaurants, all majority owned by farmers. Um, and we're in Washington, DC, Maryland, Virginia, uh, and one in Pennsylvania. We also have our own bakery and our own distillery. Pre-COVID, we had over a thousand employees. Um, COVID knocked us down to under a hundred employees. And I'm, I'm proud to say on behalf of my team that we're back to almost 900 employees. And so when we can keep restaurant workers working and we can run restaurants like this, where we are conscious and mindful of what we buy and the implications of what we buy, we can help keep folks working all the way up that chain and, and to the farm. So it's a, uh, it is certainly my life's work and a pleasure to work and, and serve on behalf of the farmers that I represent through our restaurants. And um, thanks so much for inviting me here today. Thank you, Dan. Jillian. Hi, Rob. I'm so thrilled to be here today. Thanks for having me. My name is Jillian Meyer. Uh, at Share Our Strength, we're focused on ensuring that every child has access to healthy food 365 days a year. One of the ways we do that is by operating the No Kid Hungry campaign it functions in 37 states. These are public-private partnerships focused on working with schools, community-based organizations, and government agencies to increase participation in the federal child nutrition programs, including Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, SNAP, Pandemic EBT, School Breakfast, Summer Meals, and After School Meals. We do that by allocating grants to schools and community organizations, providing technical assistance, sharing best practices, and really pushing for federal and state legislative change. Since March, 2020, at the start of the pandemic, No Kid Hungry has to date provided more than $70 million in grants to almost 2000 organizations across all 50 states, DC, Guam, and Puerto Rico. And I'm really looking forward to learning from my fellow panelists today. Righty. Well, thanks everyone. And I uh, hope those uh, tuning in today uh, really appreciate the uh, the value and the expertise uh, that each of you bring uh, to, uh, to this important topic here. Uh, we also, because of the range of perspectives here, uh, this is such a massive issue. We know that there are a number of places that we can go. We will open up the Q&A. Um, uh, we will have a, a series of conversations going on here, Q&A, but um, uh, you know, I, I do expect that we will end up with more questions uh, at the conclusion here, but this is obviously uh, one point in time, uh, part of a much larger ongoing conversation about what our food system should look like going on to be the most resilient, the most equitable and fair uh, for everyone along the space here. But let's jump into some questions here uh, for our panelists. Patty, I'll start again with you. And we've seen a huge shift in the structure of the food system just five or six decades ago, we had a diverse kind of regional food processing infrastructure. And today, just a handful of large plants process the vast majority of our food. Can you speak a little bit to why this has been especially problematic for farmers during the pandemic and during storms like the one, recent ones we had across the Great Plains? And what can we do to build resilience to future crises? Simple question. Yeah, easy. Uh, sure, thanks, Rob. Actually, uh, consolidation, concentration, hyper-specialization hyper has occurred in almost all parts of the food processing. Um, there are much fewer plants, and those that are still left are much bigger. Meat processing isn't the, is the most uh, dramatic, of course. There's only 50 plants that account for 98% of the national beef slaughter in the U.S. One pork plant in South Dakota processes 5% of all the pork in the U.S. It's not just in meat. Concentration has been seen elsewhere. We've seen it in flour milling and dairy processing, for example. In the 70s, there were nearly 4,000 dairy manufacturing plants. 
In 2010, there were only one, or about a thousand, sorry. This has serious consequences for every farmer, even before the pandemic. It really takes the opportunity of finding the best market out of the, out of the equation for any producer. Ranchers have to drive livestock uh, long distance, distances to get processed, um, which is expensive, bad for animal health, decreases final, final product uh, quality, uh, things like that. And there are a few options. Um, if a farmer is displeased with the closest processing plant, they can't necessarily take them just on the road to another one. During the, pand during the pandemic, we saw massive backups across the, uh, the food supply chain, which resulted in huge headaches for farmers who had to quickly find other options or in worst cases, um, destroy animals, destroy food, because they had no, no place to go with it. Consumers were affected too with uh, food shortages and higher prices. We've seen similar dis disruptions uh, across the Great Plains, especially with the electricity outages uh, in the recent um, uh, few days um, from the, uh, the storms that were going through. And future disruptions are likely to change, are likely to happen without more climate change. Um, we do need to build resilient, um, build resilience to prevent future disruptions. Um, there are some small plants, but there's not necessarily enough of them anywhere to absorb the shock. In fact, uh, since the pand pandemic, we've been hearing stories across the nation about small, small meat processing plants that are booked out almost two years. Farmers aren't able to get their animals in for almost two years um, on, their, on the processing calendars. So we need, to, we need to strengthen local regional food infrastructures so there's more of a buffer if and when a plant shuts down. Legislators are already working on strengthening meat processing by offering financial support to cover some costs of inspections uh, and training new employees, things like that. But similar efforts are also um, could help in other sectors. We need to strengthen the rural infrastructure. We need to prepare for, for better stresses of climate change. Nationally, our infrastructure is in serious need of improvement. Um, it's especially poor in rural areas where 13% of rural roads are in poor condition. And in one in, two, one in 12 rural bridges need repair or, or replacement. So we need to make sure that our roads and bridges can withstand wild temperature changes, um, wind, precipitation, other climate related challenges that can uh, continue, trans so we can continue transporting food from our farms to our consumers. Well, thanks, Patty. And it's certainly, it's tough to forget some of those uh, early images during the pandemic with uh, milk needing to be dumped and, and other food being uh, destroyed. So uh, thanks for that. Dan, uh, from your perspective uh, at the restaurants uh, and staying on this topic of corporate consolidation, uh, we know, and you may have a more accurate number here, but somewhere around 100,000 restaurants have closed, the vast majority of those being independently owned businesses. But we know that some of the big chains have fared better, have rebounded much more quickly, can you speak a little bit to why we've seen this huge gap between uh, large corporations and independent restaurants and what it means for farmers, food vendors, and restaurant workers in their communities? And will funding for independent restaurants uh, included in the American Rescue Plan help with any of these issues? There is, there is definitely a big gap between the way the, uh, the large corporate restaurant chains are performing and what's happened to the, the smaller, you know, the, ind the truly independent, the singular restaurants and, and the regional independents like us. You know, our reality is that the big corporations have um, these large restaurant companies. They're excellent at what they do. They are excellent at access to capital. They have leverage with landlords. They have scale, sophistication. The, the thing that, that they have that is their magic, which I also think is the place that we can make change is they have a customer base that, that really lets them um, and enables them in, in their common thinking. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not anti big restaurant company at all. This is just that I believe that when, when the customer base is, um, unintentionally unconscious to, to the implications of their decisions, the big restaurant chains know that, right? So meaning if they can buy something cheaper and they can still win with their customer, well, with that single stakeholder view where profit is the stakeholder, what do you do? You buy something cheaper. If cheaper means imported, if cheaper means less healthful, if cheaper means, um, through a supply chain that, that does some unconscionable things with workers or animals, cheaper means cheaper. The customer allows it, the customer rewards it, the corporation keeps doing it. Uh, 
the, the positivity here is that um, these big restaurant companies, they, they have this intelligence where they, they understand this. And so they know how to win. Cheap food helps them win. Low quality helps them win. A disregard for the supply chain, that all helps them win. But I think what we try to do is educate all of the dining customers because these big restaurant corporations are smart. If the customers start to ask different questions, demand different things, if you sort of get a look behind the veil and, and we ask for this transparency, I think the same thing happens when workers demand things. This is what will potentially even some of the playing field between the independents um, like myself and a lot of my colleagues that, that sort of approach the business we do and the big corporations, which is that the customers can level the playing field. The diners can say, we care about what you buy. I care, you know, I, I prefer this pork over that pork. Oh, look at the implications of what's on my plate. So, um, you know, look, I'm incredibly thankful of the government support. And Rob, you asked that question. Yes, we, and especially this, this latest round where it's really going to groups with less than 20 restaurants and it's targeted at independents or uh, restaurants that are owned by, by folks of color um, that will make a huge difference. So I'm not actually expecting the big extinction event of restaurants. I think there's probably over 130,000 that are closed and have been closed. This government stimulus has really helped. I think a lot of the elected officials worked hard on behalf of restaurants. We need the help. So it really matters to the farmers that we supply because I believe the restaurants who care the most about the quality of what they're buying are the ones that affect independent family farmers upstream. Um, and so I think if we can help educate the voice of the customer, that can push the changes. Of course, I see the world from where I sit, which is at the end of this chain. But um, between the government stimulus and a more mindful customer and a reward of businesses who do this in what I think of as a conscious capitalist way, as opposed to an unconsciously capitalist way, uh, we can make real change. Great. Well, your enthusiasm or positivity is, is a little bit infectious here. And so I'm encouraged by that. Uh, and, and also the, the message of educating the consumer. Mark, if we can uh, turn to you and you know the perspective from uh, meat plant workers, it's obviously that uh, corporate power hasn't had an enormous impact there. We know, uh, as you've mentioned, uh, that as workers felt ear, uh, ill, we saw the giant meat plants, you know, wielding their influence um, in the interest of cost and not always in the interest of safety. Um, how has this been harmful for workers in their communities? And how does unionization help prevent uh, this kind of manipulation? Well, the first, I, I wanna point out that you, you use an important word there, communities, because what happens in these meatpacking plants does not isolate itself to the meatpacking plants. It, it's affecting the entire communities in which they operate, um, of what happens in there. In the early days of this pandemic, uh, we focused first and foremost on safety. Um, it, was, it was our union that, that was the first to, to push the employers for things. Even the CDC said were not even necessary. Um, it was our union that pushed for mask and social distancing inside these facilities, this layered PPE approach, um, work on the ventilation systems inside a meatpacking plant, all that safety part. That was the first thing we looked at because we understood not only were we talking about the safety of our members and the workers that were involved there, but those communities as well. Um, but we also had the discussion about how important we actually were to this supply chain and how important it was that if those workers in those meat plants weren't safe, the whole supply chain was going to collapse. And, and from my feel as a, as growing up in small town, Iowa, uh, working in a meatpacking plant and then representing workers in meatpacking plants for years, uh, folks, we were dangerously close to a collapse uh, of that system. Uh, workers were falling sick at a rate that, that no one could keep up on. Local health departments did not know, um, what the illness rates were in communities. Uh, no government agency knew. The people that actually knew, um, I believe was, was 
the leadership of our union because having a union inside those meatpacking plants entitles us to information um, as it relates to working conditions where they, an employer can't say we're not going to provide information. When it comes to the safety and health of our membership, we have a, a legal right to that information. Working around the HIPAA laws that were in place, but we were to able to ascertain really the extent of the outbreaks that were taking place. The first one I can think of that comes to mind is what, what Patty mentioned, the plant in South Dakota, where there was 5% of production of, this, of, of pork in the country. But we were able to really pinpoint how bad this was gonna be by the information we were able to get as the bargaining representative about how bad COVID-19 was actually gonna be in a meatpacking plant. So just by the fact of having a union, it entitled us to information and then help not only our members, but it helped the community at large because we could actually talk about what we knew. We wouldn't know which individual had COVID, but we knew how many individuals had COVID because of the rights that we had under our collective bargaining agreements. That ended up being a benefit for the entire community. Um, I would say from the onset of this pandemic, government agencies failed workers, failed farmers, failed communities because they failed to do certain things that were in their scope. OSHA should have filed or should have put a temporary emergency standard in place early in this pandemic, just as happened under the H1N1 uh, pandemic that happened. We should have been able to have that emergency standard to protect those workers. And if we had it early enough, we could have saved lives, we could have prevented illnesses, and then maybe, just maybe, we could have not had to have closures of multiple plants at the same time, which really put the strain on this food supply system. So the government, you know, we could sit around and, and cast blame on who, who, who really failed who first. Our federal government failed us miserably at this, in, in this time when we needed them the most. All right, thanks, Mark. And thanks for the reminder of the interconnections here, uh, particularly in a pandemic like this and throughout the entire community. Jillian, uh, one of the most heartbreaking side effects of the pandemic has been the spike in hunger. And especially among children that you focus on, there's been a lot of efforts to make sure that kids are getting fed, uh, including the Farmers uh, to Families Food Box Program and other efforts uh, to provide food to food banks. Uh, but, we also know that according to some programs like SNAP and Pandemic EBT uh, were some of the best ways to respond to the problem. Can you talk about what makes these programs especially effective and other ways uh, to kind of respond in a pandemic like this for hunger and food insecurity? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's not gonna come as a surprise to anyone, but you know, since the start of the pandemic, children across the US have faced hunger at rates we haven't seen in decades. Um, prior to the pandemic, about one in seven children lived in a family facing food insecurity. And currently experts are estimating that number is now one in four. So within a year, we've erased decades of progress in fighting childhood hunger. But the nutrition programs that existed and have existed for decades are designed to work together. So it's definitely not a, a one size fits all approach. The idea is you combine all of these programs, the innovation in the farmers to families food boxes, the innovation within food banks with the existing programs like the supplemental Nut nutrition assistance program to allow families to get the help they need. So for example, the SNAP program is effective and essential. It provides families with a grocery benefit they can use to purchase some of the food their kids need when they need it. It works in conjunction with school meals which provides critical nutrition for children during the week and pandemic EBT, which is a program that stands up in emergency situations like we are in to really cover the gap when kids aren't in school. So for kids that fall below a, a certain income threshold, they can get a free breakfast and a free lunch and a free after school meal every day. So what happens when those kids can't access those meals? Pandemic EBT really covers the cost of those missed meals so families can supplement their income. So for many families, having SNAP and pandemic EBT benefits frees up money in their tight budgets. Dollars that otherwise would have bought food can be used for rent, medicine, 
high speed internet connection so kids can learn remotely. Um, and you know, we also want to stress that SNAP and Pandemic EBT benefits the entire community, really jumpstarting a cycle of recovery. When families use SNAP dollars to buy food for their kids, that food comes from farmers who can use money to pay for goods, services, equipment, and supplies that they need. And since the benefits are spent at local grocery stores, it leads to more jobs, wages, and local economic activity in their communities. It's really a cycle where one program builds upon another until families are really through this pandemic and can get back on their feet, unemployment stabilizes a little bit, jobs are more plentiful. Um, we wanna support families. We wanna ensure that they have what they need every day and they're not waiting for the government to pass another relief bill that could be six, eight months in the making. Um, we wanna give them that security that they can feed their kids every day. So it's really important to think about them as a holistic set of, of programs where families can sort of opt in and out to the ones that make the most sense for their families. All right, thank you, Jillian. And you know, another critical uh, aspect of, of the food sector obviously are farm workers. Bruce, like many Americans, you know, these farm workers have experienced financial difficulties as a result of the pandemic. But because as you noted at the beginning, uh, many of these are undocumented. They don't always either have access to the same assistance or um, have barriers to that access. Can you tell us about which programs aren't available uh, to undocumented workers and those challenges and what options are available instead? And then tacking on, how would legislation like uh, Farm Workforce Modernization Act that offers a path to legal status uh, begin to help address this problem? Thanks again for having me and for uh, you know having a focus on on farm workers. Um, so there are about 2.4 million farm workers in the United States. Uh, their wages are among the lowest of any occupation in the country. Their rates of job injuries and fatalities are among the highest in the country. Very few farm workers receive any fringe benefits such as paid sick leave or paid vacation, let alone health insurance. Uh, many farm workers because of their uh, low wages are living in uh, inadequate housing, often very crowded housing. Uh, so these and other uh, factors in farm workers' lives uh, you know, place them at great risk as the uh, pandemic developed. And as we all know, farm workers were designated as essential workers in the food and agriculture system. And so they were expected to continue to work uh, throughout the pandemic. Now, some of them uh, did suffer job losses uh, because many farms had their uh, focus on selling to restaurants. And with the demise of the restaurants due to the pandemic, uh, there were a lot of farms that uh, shut down or cut back and, and there were many farm workers who lost work as a result of that. Um, and, uh, but many farm workers, you know, continued to work. And unfortunately, you know, there, the, the factors I mentioned and others contributed to a real problem that led to high uh, prevalence of uh, COVID-19 among farm workers. They were often working in uh, crowded conditions out in the fields. They often did not have adequate separate uh, sanitary facilities. So they'd be you know, going to a, a port john and there'd be a group of people around uh, and lack of uh, adequate number of sanitary facilities. Uh, again, the, the crowded housing, some of which is controlled by the employers. Um, there was also, uh, there were also challenges because of lack of immigration status. Uh, the large majority of farm workers are immigrants and a majority are undocumented. Uh, so most were born in a foreign country. For most, English is not their first language. For some, Spanish is not even their first language. It's a, um, a language from Central America. Um, and so the, the information flow to many farm workers was inadequate. Um, combined with their lack of access to healthcare, often lack of transportation, um, they, many of them were not able to get tested. 
because so many of them were undocumented, many of them were afraid to get tested uh, for fear that a positive test would mean not only a loss of job potentially, but arrest and deportation, their families split, uh, uh, split up. Uh, so there are just you know, many, many challenges. And then as the vaccines began, uh, start to become available, uh, there were many uh, obstacles. There are many obstacles to farm workers receiving the vaccines. Again, there are isolated rural areas, um, lack of transportation, uh, and, and a lot of misinformation about the vaccines, uh, a lot of concerns about the health effects uh, of, of the vaccines. Um, so a lot of groups around the country are trying to educate farm workers, trying to reach out to them. And, uh, you know, that requires, because they're often so marginalized and, and afraid of what's going to happen to them, it requires trusted organizations in the local areas to, to uh, have the resources to reach them. And, uh, and I agree with Mark, uh, our government, our federal government especially, really f I felt with uh, an emergency temporary standard on occupational safety um, and health that would have uh, required masks and required provision of masks, required testing, and provided accurate information uh, to farm workers. And uh, just briefly, um, while uh, U.S. citizens and, and long-term legal residents who are farm workers are eligible for public benefits and government programs, undocumented immigrants are basically not eligible for anything. Um, they're not even eligible for legal aid to help them understand what their rights are. And so a lot of um, what we, one of our highest priorities is immigration status. That is a program that would allow undocumented farm workers and their family members to earn legal immigration status leading to a green card or permanent residency and then US citizenship. So last week, uh, as you were alluding to Rob, the House of Representatives uh, uh, with support from the National Farmers Union, I might add, um, passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act. And it would do just that. It's a bipartisan labor management compromise, very difficult negotiations, but they would, it would allow undocumented immigrants after years of working in agriculture and their family members to earn legal immigration status. And it would revise the existing H-2A guest worker program uh, to, to get bipartisan support. Everybody had to make a series of concessions. It won the support of almost all Democrats in the House uh, and 30 Republicans in the House. And now we hope it'll move on to um, the Senate. And if we could pass it in the Senate, our goal is to build on the legal status, work with farm worker groups all over the country to mobilize them to really improve their wages and working conditions, access to services and benefits. Well, thanks, Bruce. And, and obviously some of those uh, challenges that you brought up about access to uh, many of the services, but in particular uh, vaccination uh, to kind of better protect many of these farm workers, you know, is an enormous challenge uh, because of some of that isolation. Um, and, and we know that there are you know, existing barriers uh, even in uh, the rest of the rural communities. But Patty, you know, it still is good news, right? That I, we're seeing more and more Americans getting vaccinated. Uh, but some of the infrastructure issues and unfunded medical systems that uh, you and others have kind of alluded to here are particularly challenging uh, to make things like just a simple appointment. Can you tell us a little bit more about some of those barriers that folks are having and what can be done to make vaccines more accessible to rural residents? Sure, thanks Rob. Um, yeah, we are starting to see more um, individuals getting vaccinated, especially in rural areas. We're starting to see many states that are allowing farmers and those involved in agriculture uh, to get the vaccine. They're the next on the list kind of to get, to get the vaccine. So that's good. Um, farmers and ranchers and egg workers are considered essential workers in, in many parts of the country right now. So in order to keep our uh, food supply going strong, we need to get people vaccinated, not get sick, right? So unfortunately, it's a lot harder for rural residents to know when they are uh, eligible. Uh, most states only have online vaccination systems, uh, registration systems. So, and, and unfortunately, 
the lack of broadband across the rural areas has made it really difficult for many individuals to make these appointments. One in three rural Americans don't have access to broadband, which is about 20 million uh, people across the country. Uh, that in itself is making it very difficult for rural Americans just to sign up for slots. Um, also, there's a lack of uh, pharmacies and medical facilities in, in rural communities. Between 2013 and 2018, 16% of independent rural pharmacies went out of business, leaving more than 630 communities with no pharmacy or medical facilities at all. Uh, so for many uh, rural Americans, that means they'll have to drive significant distances to get vaccinated or for people without cars or who are disabled, it may not be an option for them. So we're also seeing uh, huge uh, underfunded issues with rural healthcare systems, uh, lack of medical professionals. There's 20% of Americans live in rural communities, but only 11% of US doctors practice in those communities. So there's a, straight, a shortage of trained professionals to administer shots in rural areas. We're also seeing that uh, we know that these vaccines need to be stored in extremely cold freezers, uh, which are extremely expensive. And many of these facilities don't have uh, the, the cost and the money to, to purchase these, uh, leaving these uh, chronically underfunded um, facilities without uh, access to having to put the vaccine at, at the facilities. <clears throat> So there are ways to fix it. I mean, obviously, how do we start? Uh, we need to increase phone registrations for vaccines. Uh, we need to expand sites for, um, for vaccinations uh, other than pharmacies or, or clinics. I know the Dollar Generals are starting to pop up in every, sing every community across the country, it seems. Uh, maybe uh, they've already offered at one time to uh, start giving vaccinations uh, at their stores. Um, or other common, common gathering places like churches or community centers. There are places that uh, if they're starting to offer that we need to be able to take them up on offers uh, to offer rural residents uh, vaccinations. Um, offer transportation. Uh, and like Bruce said, we need to increase the education and the outreach to all these individuals to make sure that they, they know what they're getting uh, and know when they can get them. So there's a lot of things that we can do, but it's gonna take an entire community effort to make sure that we get everyone vaccinated. All right, thanks, Patty. And uh, Bruce, kind of, you know, continuing with this um, idea of uh, vaccines and barriers and so forth. Um, uh, within the the meat plants um, uh, themselves, uh, we know that it's not just COVID nineteen, but uh, that there are other dangers uh, uh, that workers continue to face, and that consolidation is making that an ever growing. Uh, challenge. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's made uh, uh, meat plants um, uh, dangerous um, and what can be done to, to make them safer? And I think that's for Mark. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I, I meant Mark. Sorry, Bruce. Sorry, Mark. So, you know, on the, here's, you know, what makes, what makes a meat packing plant so dangerous is, again, somebody who used to work on one. It's, you know, the pace of production or the speed in which one person is, is supposed to work. And we hear a lot of conversations in the public about line speed. Um, I don't mind what the line speed is, as long as it's not too much for that individual, those individuals along the line. And the problem is in a meatpacking plant, you can't put enough individuals to go as fast as they want to go. So it's, it's a line, it's a, it's a pace of production. It's a line speed issue. We can't overwork people. Their bodies do break down. That's what, one thing that makes it dangerous. Besides the conditions that we all know about, you know, the slips, trips, falls, lacerations, all of those things are one thing, but it's that pace of production. And, and I think if you look at, at the numbers that came out on the pork plants that are in the, in the pilot project that, that FSIS has, where you see that they have a higher injury rate where they're allowed to go faster. Um, it's just, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that the faster I work, the more my body's going to fatigue. And when I fatigue, that's when I take shortcuts. And when I take shortcuts, that's when I hurt myself. So it's that speed. And if we could get some way um, throughout the system, uh, starting with our government to say, all right, let's just slow this stuff down. It's going to make safer food. It's going to make safer workers. It's going to make a better product and it's gonna make a better food supply chain for everyone if we would all just slow down. Slowing down is gonna mean more, we need more capacity. Um, I was really heartened to see uh, when Secretary Vilsack was at his confirmation hearing, he spoke to the fact that they're, 
that COVID has pointed out that we actually need more capacity in this industry. We can't have these huge plants being the only point of production to get that, that hog to market. It can't go to just one place. You have to have more space. And I think if we have more capacity, then as a society, we can slow that work down and we can have more things. But I think the key is going to be to get more capacity more capacity, but it actually needs to go back to what Patty had talked about earlier. If we can move back to a regional system where we have more plants in an area. When I grew up in Northwest Iowa, I couldn't throw a rock without hitting a meatpacking plant. Now I, I think maybe there's three or four maybe that, that do the work. We need to get back to having more plants. So one event doesn't stifle the whole system. It also is good for the workers because we'll be able to kill 10,000 hogs in a much slower process. So speed, slow everything down and make it safer for everyone. All righty, thanks, Mark. And thanks for kind of highlighting, right? Again, uh, one of the themes for today is all this kind of interconnectedness and, and the fact that, um, you know, moving to greater capacity and building more regional processing plants also gives uh, farmers uh, more access uh, to more markets and uh, creates a, a more reliable uh, system for them uh, as well. Um, flipping just a little bit though to uh, back to food insecurity and, and Jillian, um, you know, this issue around whether or not folks have enough food um, is sometimes um, regrettably framed as an urban problem, um, uh, but we know it affects rural areas as well. Can you speak a little bit about some of the specific issues that make it difficult to address hunger uh, in rural areas? Yeah, absolutely. And Rob, you're, you're completely right. Um, you know, the, the last set of data I have is from 2018. And at that point, 16.5% of rural households faced food insecurity compared to 13.5% of households in urban and suburban areas. Obviously, through COVID, we expect those numbers to be much higher now, and, that, and those numbers, uh, that discrepancy to be more glaring. And I think this also gets back to a lot of the reasons Patty flagged for challenges to vaccinations. Same thing on the food security front. The infrastructure is simply not there in most of our rural communities. You know, transportation is always an issue. When a school is offering meals during the school year, kids are already in the building and can easily access those meals. During the summer, families in rural areas travel so many more miles than their urban counterparts. And if your nearest meal site is 30 miles away, it's much less likely a family is going to make that trip every day for lunch. And unfortunately, under the pre-COVID rules, families did have to come every day and the kids had to eat on site. Now, luckily we have waivers in place throughout the pandemic saying that families could receive multiple meals and they don't have to eat on site, but that, uh, that authority expires in September. So we're gonna be back to the same challenges for feeding rural kids. Uh, we also see fewer grocery stores and those grocery stores are much less likely to accept SNAP and WIC cards and, WIC, and, and let families redeem those benefits. So they can't really use the government benefits they have in these communities unless they wanna drive much further away using precious gas dollars. And I'll also say population density is obviously a huge challenge. Free after school and summer meals are available in communities where 50% or more of the population qualifies for free reduced price lunch. So you have to have a pretty good density of low income families. Unfortunately, when they're spread out across rural areas, it's much harder to reach that threshold which means many less schools are offering these meal programs, forcing families to really not partake in what is available and free to them. Okay. Thank you. And then, you know, let's look back. Dan, uh, you, you gave us a good snapshot there at the beginning about some of the, the challenges and so forth. And, and, and we know that the, the challenges for independent restaurants have been around for a long time, even pre-pandemic. But looking forward to the future, uh, what can be done to ensure um, uh, that uh, independent restaurants uh, thrive and that all the, uh, the farmers, uh, ranchers, and workers through the system 
you know, supplying uh, quality food um, have uh, that uh, important market of independent restaurants, uh, you know, well uh, into the future in a very successful way. I, you know, Rob, I appreciate that question because, you know, as with a lot of these topics, there isn't necessarily a straight, simple line to the answer, right? So we need independent restaurants to thrive because we see the positive ripple effect of what that does, you know, up the supply chain to, to independent producers and also for quality food to guests. And also restaurants are a big part of the communities. You know, I listened to Jillian speaking and it's like, it's heartbreaking. Our, we need our schools to provide food because we can't get affordable food or we can't get jobs to people who need to make a living. I mean, the problems are, are really horrifying, but I'm an optimist. So the first thing, frankly, that comes to my mind of how do we help independent restaurants survive and stay strong is actually a, a restructuring of restaurants' occupancy costs. I realize this sounds like a non-ag food topic, but um, the, the, the common approach for restaurants is to pay a fixed amount of rent, including the landlord's or the landowner's share of the property tax. And that's just the conventional wisdom. There is so much pressure on an independent restaurant to pay their occupancy costs and to pay their property taxes that it is harder to buy premium ingredients and it is harder to reinvest in your employees. So this is a topic that is one thing that I think mean, there are opportunities, opportunities to change for restaurants is, is this sort of landlord tenant relationship. Um, and there's a tax aspect to it. Um, the other thing that can help independent restaurants, and this is where I see producers and restaurateurs joining forces is more product stories. You know, when we, the collective, come up with ideas like uh, bourbon peaches and we can work with independent peach growers and we can work with, you know, independent distillers and we can, we can do the value adding. Either the producers can do it uh, or we, the restaurateurs, can do it. We can create new products, new ideas, show the innovation to the diners. So I, I think there are things that we can change and we need great product stories. And so I work with a lot of farmers and they don't wanna be on the front page of a magazine, right? That isn't why Patty probably is a dairy farmer because she's raising her hand saying, everybody look at me. However, our diners care, Patty, they wanna know you. They wanna hear your story. They are amazed by the work of your family and being a dairy farmer and what it takes. So I think when we can tell more stories it then becomes apparent the restaurants who can't tell those stories. And big restaurant corporations can do this, right? So cheapest isn't always best. Maximizing ROI at some point, how much is enough? And don't you want long-term sustainable products instead of the cheapest, fastest right now? So I think we, we can put our voices together. We can innovate with products. And, you know, I listen to some of these topics and I think if we put our voice together on big ag antitrust regulation, then it's not just the usual suspects talking about it. It's the whole chain. Farm worker path to citizenship. It matters to our diners. It's food safety. It's more money into the economy. Truth in labeling laws. We can work together. Climate change actions. That kind of regulation. I think we have an opportunity to not just be the usual suspects advocating on behalf of one, uh, one message or one change or one regulation. But when we join our voices, voices together, like I look at this panel, you can see I get a little excited, but I think, okay, folks aren't necessarily used to hearing all of us say we actually want the same thing. And this is where you get bipartisan support and you get this community support and you realize that like Patty and I's politics are about food, life, quality, sustainability of our businesses for multi-generations. It's not what color hat we wear. So I think when we find this common ground on these messages, we can move the elected officials and understand that we're working on behalf of real individuals. Because I can tell you, a few investors probably need to suffer. Sorry, whoever owns that one pork plant that, that produces X percent of our pork supply 
I hope they get a lower return, but that return will go elsewhere to more diversified set of businesses. So I'm probably over my time, but thanks for letting me get it out there. Dan, it's a great message and thank you for, for that uh, vision. It's certainly one I think a, a lot of us can, can get behind and certainly we need to work uh, toward, those, toward those goals. Uh, at, at this point, uh, Mark, if, if I can turn to you for you know, another topic that's been uh, kind of highlighted and center um, uh, in the food world uh, recently, and that's uh, racial equity. Uh, certainly within the meat plant uh, world, we know that those uh, workers of color have been especially impacted. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly disproportionate to, uh, to the rest of, of Americans. What do you attribute this disparity to and what can be done to ensure that meat plant workers, uh, all meat plant workers are adequately protected? Well, let's start by, by not falling for the, uh, the obvious uh, line coming out of some governors, I won't mention her name, Christy Nome, but it's not because these workers live in multi-generational families and that they uh, live, live differently than we do. That's not why, why people of color were falling sick more. It's a question of economics um, and questions of being, you know, the ones that were more apt to be exploited. The fact is that the, the people of color didn't have the luxury nor the opportunity to take days off of work. In a meat plant, they didn't have the luxury to just not show up. Um, so what needs to happen is, and a lot of this burden will fall on us, but with, with your solidarity, we need to start moving things towards paid sick leave where people, there's that, not a culture of working while sick. Um, but that culture of working while sick isn't a cultural thing, it's an economic thing because people can't afford to miss work. And so when you look at people of color falling sick at a higher rate than, than Caucasians, it is truly an economic issue. Um, people of color, new immigrants, they're the ones who, who need that economic lift. And because they don't have that economic lift, they're forced to go do things that quite frankly, the people on this panel would not have to go, to go do for luxury of the color of our skin and the economics that our grandfathers and our grandmothers and the people before us built. They're building that for their next generations, but we need to focus on this so it's not Let's just, I want to remind everybody, let's not fall for the, for the, you know, the, the falsehood that's sitting out there that the reason that they got sick is how they live. It's because they play soccer. It's because they live in multi-generational homes or they'll have 10 people living in an apartment. Those are all economic questions and we can solve those economic questions quicker than we can solve the racism that's happening in this country. All right. Thank you, Mark. Bruce, looking into the future, um, obviously one of the biggest threats facing uh, every, all part of the food and agriculture space is climate change, but especially, you know, the, it's a, an enormous threat for, for farm workers out there. Can you speak just briefly to some of the ways that climate change is, is already affecting our farm workers' health and well-being, and what folks can do to better protect uh, against uh, those threats and risk. Yes, thanks. So climate change is resulting in very high temperatures, which uh, causes farm workers to suffer heat stress related uh, illnesses and, and death. It's causing um, wildfires that cause farm workers to be inhaling smoke while they're working in the fields. Um, it's causing drought where so that in their communities, they don't have enough water. Um, they're losing work as a result of, uh, of the heat and the hurricanes and, and other natural disasters. Um, so it, it's another set of problems that are, all fall back to uh, a set of solutions that are needed for a variety of things farm workers are going through. The, the, the most important um, 
uh, advances that farm workers have ever made is, have been as a result of union organizing and winning collective bargaining agreements. So that's why our organization supports union organizing. The power to negotiate with the employer and reach an agreement uh, has also led to policy uh, influence over what happens in our government. Um, there's also corporate social responsibility projects that are worker empowering, such as the Equitable Food Initiative, which we helped found. Uh, both uh, unions and the corporate social responsibility initiatives work holistically with the supermarket chains and the restaurant chains that so often determine at least part of what uh, the farmers can do for the farm workers. Uh, so we try to work holistically, but we, we also need policy change, um, re mandatory paid sick leave. We need immigration policies I talked about before. Some farm workers are not even covered by the minimum wage, the special exclusions for minimum wage and all farm workers are excluded from overtime pay. These kinds of exclusions need to, to end. We need access to healthcare. We need stronger and better safety standards, and we need enforcement of workers' rights. There are many employers that are getting away with violating workers' rights. And really it works to the disadvantage of the law-abiding competitors in agriculture. We need to go after the, uh, the abusers and uh, create a level playing field uh, for everybody concerned. Uh, and, and we need our government to be funding programs that reach farm workers through trusted emissaries in their local communities who speak their language, come from the, you know, their backgrounds and can help empower them to improve their wages, working conditions, health access to healthcare and access to the justice system. Alrighty. Thank you, Bruce. And you know, I have to say there's so much more that we could talk about. And I feel like we're in many ways just beginning this uh, but uh, I, I do expect, you know, for everyone that certainly uh, we will be continuing this conversation, this effort uh, toward a vision of a fairer, more equitable uh, and resilient uh, food system, because we do understand uh, that from the farmer to the farm worker, to those who are processing uh, our food, uh, to those who are making sure that uh, there is food uh, for us in restaurants and for those who are hungry, that uh, we are all very much interconnected here and uh, we can and should and will do better. And with that, I will at, at this point thank all of our panelists uh, for uh, your thoughtful conversation today, for your input. I would encourage uh, those attending today to remain engaged and stay focused uh, with us. Uh, you can certainly learn more at uh, National Farmers Union's website at nfu.org. And uh, with that, uh, once again, I wish everyone a happy National Agriculture Day and thank you and have a great rest of your afternoon. Take care everyone. <laughs>